everybody, I'm Evie Roberts, and this is my podcast, Talking in the Dark. Welcome. The aim of this podcast is to raise awareness about blindness, visual impairment, and disability in general, in a happy and light-hearted way. For those of you that don't know, I am blind. I was born with a condition called bilateral anophthalmia. Try spelling that one. It basically means that when I was born, my eyes didn't develop properly, so I wear prosthetics instead. The goal of this podcast is to remove some of the stigma and stereotypes around disabilities, whilst also having fun at the same time. Each week, I will be interviewing people from all walks of life including some with hidden or physical disabilities like mine, and getting to know a little bit more about them and the lives they lead. This week, I am very excited to tell you that I will be talking to actor, author, and all-round icon, Stephen Fry. My name is Evie Roberts, and this is my podcast, Talking in the Dark. Welcome. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Evie, I'm extremely well, and thank you for that glorious introduction. I I don't feel the least bit worthy of it, but it's lovely to speak to you. Oh, you are totally worthy of it. How's your day going? I know know it's, you know, you're in LA, so what time is it over there for you? It's only nine in the morning, but if I tell you, you won't believe me that I have been up since 4.30, and I've been to the gym. Can you honestly... Honestly, picture me in a gymnasium, and yet there I was doing various things. There's kinds of reasons for it, but um, I won't go into them too much mad detail, but I had an accident in September last year. I walked off stage um, not knowing that the part of the stage I was walking off was six foot above concrete, (laughs) so I broke my pelvis in four places and my leg in a couple of places and a bunch of ribs. Um, and that meant that in order to get myself, once the bones had healed, which takes a month or so, in order to get myself physically able, really, just to do stairs and walking and generally welcome myself back into the world of the mobile, uh, I had to do quite a lot of physiotherapy and gym. So I'm carrying on with that. So that's a long answer to your question. (laughs) But although it's only nine in the morning or so, I have had a pretty full day already. Yes, it definitely sounds like it. But oh my gosh, like that accident sounds so painful. Is the physio going well? Physio has gone really well. And I have to say, um, it's all worked pretty well because of the painkillers that I had to begin with. At first, I was very British and thought I I shouldn't have painkillers. I'm English. Uh, It's my duty to be in pain. Uh, anything that takes me out of out of pain is an American indulgence, and I must uh, resist it. But I was persuaded that the point of these painkillers was to get me on my feet as soon as possible. That every day you're lying in bed not moving is at least a week of extra physiotherapy. So I took the, the painkillers, which were very strong and worked very well, um, and was on my feet pretty early. The, the the great thing then, of course, was to have, have to tail off the, the painkillers because it's a strange thing, Evie, but there is no such thing as a free drug. That There's an old medical saying is there are two types of drug. When I say drug, I don't mean street drug or illegal drug. I mean pharmaceutical drug, you know, like um, what you might call medication. Yeah. There are two kinds. There's the kinds that don't have side effects and the kinds that work. In other words, all drugs that work have side effects. And painkillers are probably more than most because the the side effect is addiction. They're incredibly addictive. They take over the part of the brain that that uh, that that is you know most receptive to pleasure, and and it um, shuts off all reason. Fortunately, I didn't get to that stage of addiction, but it was probably getting close. Again, a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that at all. Well, I have to say, before we begin properly, that I am an extremely big fan of you. Um, we're going to talk in a little bit about the Harry Potter audiobooks that you narrated. Mm. Um, 
But those audiobooks have been a huge part of my childhood and still are to this day a really massive source of comfort for me. Um, so I would just like to say thank you. Oh, I cannot tell you what pleasure that gives me, Evie. You know, um, the business of, of doing a, a, an audiobook, it, it's a pleasurable thought when the book is an enormous success or a historical success like the Harry Potter books. Though, of course, at the time I was reading them, I had no idea they were going to be so huge because I did them as each book came out. And so for the first three books, she wasn't well known. And the Harry Potter franchise, as we'd now call it, wasn't this huge beer moth. Um, uh, so what I'm really saying is you, you spend hours in a glass box talking to a microphone and you lose all sense that anybody's ever going to listen to this. And you think, I am wasting away my time and my larynx is beginning to bleed and I am talking and talking and saying all these lines. No one's ever going to listen to this. I mean, there's so much of it. It's, and and then to meet and to hear people telling you that, that those stories being read to uh, to them has have meant something to them have helped them sleep or helped them provide a calm anchorage in a turbulent life or some sort of you know uh, solace some sort of home base or whatever you might call it and it's it's wonderful sometimes now people are really quite old to tell me that because they were young when they first listened and 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 it's a gateway back to a calmer and happier time in their life or something and there are all kinds of things, and I think it's to do with the fact, and it's interesting talking to you in particular as an unsighted person, where um, hearing a story told to you, you build the entire world in your own mind, and I don't know how an unsighted person does that, and I don't know if you've always been unsighted, so therefore all the things that you might, if I can even use the word picture, that that populate and and fill the Harry Potter universe... Um, they are not influenced by the films or even by the illustrations on the front of the book, only by the words, the words of of, of J.K. Rowling as, as I read them. And, and that makes your Harry Potter probably more unique than most people's because most people's won't be able to help borrowing from the visual imagery that has surrounded these uh, stories now since the films and, and, and other illustrations and so on began. So I wonder... I wonder how you, you know, how you navigate that world, how you, how you imagine the castles and the rooms and the characters. Uh, how, how would you say you did? Do you know what? That's a very good question because I wouldn't really say I do. I suppose I, I just listen to the words and I listen to the descriptions of what things look like. And then I'm able to go, well, okay and you know of course you can totally use you know use the word picture but I suppose I don't really picture things and I think that does have something to do with the fact that I've been blind since birth so I've never had an I idea did. of what things look like yeah yeah that's that's fascinating and so it is all about the voice and the actions and the intent and the moral character and the personality of people as revealed by um, uh, how they speak and how they act, and that's a that that really is interesting. So, and and of course the vanity of uh, of, of a reader. You've lived with my voice for, for many many hours now. So I wonder how you again, as I say, how you picture me. But you can't, can you? You don't picture a face in the way we, we sighted people picture a face. But presumably that part of your brain that would otherwise be stored with images like a like a you know mobile phone's picture picture gallery is filled with other sense impressions i suppose is the phrase i would use other vibrations that lead you towards personality and the texture and nature of of people is that a is that a reasonable thing to say or does it make any sense yes i would say that's a very reasonable thing to say but obviously you know you were talking about you know sighted people knowing what people look like and the way in which I do that is by people's voices so I have I would say quite good voice recognition you know if someone were to say hi to me say I was walking through school I would know exactly who that person is most of the time and so just like sighted people would recognize people's faces I recognize people's voices yeah yeah that does make sense it makes enormous sense gosh well there you are well I hope one day you're 
<laughs> hear me across the street and you may be able to shout out, Stephen, it's Evie. And I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a, it, 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 it was a, um, an amazing experience reading those books because I've always enjoyed doing stories. And when my agent called me up and said, oh, there's this um, children's story that uh, they'd like you to read, um, apparently it's quite good, which should I send it to you? And I, I said, yes, thinking a children's story is quite short, you know, it's a few pages. The cat saw the dog and the dog smiled and the cat and the dog went off to, you know, uh, to the mountainside and had a picnic. The end. <laughs> but um, when, when, when I was uh, given the, the, the typescript of, of, of this book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, um, I could see it was heavy in the hand and, and, and that it was what you might call an adult length book. I thought, oh, blimey, this is going to take three days, not 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 half a day. But I started reading and was captivated by the the world of it, as, as the world has been, of course. And it was just wonderful to watch what happened. I wrote this first, you know, I read this first book. Then <laughs> Joe Rowling claims that I said this, that we were uh, finishing the first. And I said to her, Joe, this is brilliant. I'm sure it'll do really well and be a great success. And she said, well, thank you. As a matter of fact, I have already finished a second one. And she says, I said to her, good for you. It sounds so patronizing and condescending. And I hate to think I was quite as, as bad as that. But obviously, I did think, well, that's good. There's a second one. So I read the second one. And by the third one, you know, people were beginning to talk about them. Parents were beginning to say, oh, my children are reading these books and I read them as well. Or I read them out to them on the bed and then when they fall asleep, I can't help reading the next few chapters. And the the, the publisher, Bloomsbury, produced two different kinds of Harry Potter book, those with um, colourful illustrations on the front that look like children's books, and then ones with very grey, uninteresting covers that looked like adult books so that adults could read them on, on the tube train without feeling embarrassed that they were reading children's literature. <laughs> and then, of course, by the fourth one, it was a phenomenon that the world was completely talking about. And it was a news story when when a new Harry Potter came out and she was huge in America as well. And, and suddenly it was the biggest literary publishing phenomenon since Charles Dickens' day. Um, so that was it was fun to be along for that ride and and each new book that came out there was some excessive stunt to help publicize it so i remember one of them was it the fourth or fifth one was it maybe the goblet of fire where they hired a train and and joe Rowling and i got on this train she was at one end which was obviously the very popular end where all the children wanted to be where she would read out the chapter of the new book uh, on this red-coloured train that was like the Hogwarts Express. And, of course, it went from King's Cross and from the, you know, the, the, the magical platform. Uh, and I was at the other end reading reading for the, the ones who couldn't get through to hear Joe reading. But it was fun to be involved with. It really was. It was just one of those surprising things that life throws up. You know, you, you decide to become an actor or a writer or a performer of some kind and you you know you do this sitcom here and this drama there and maybe you write a book and but then certain extra little things come along and harry potter is one of them that just completely unpredictable you would never guess such a thing could come your way and and it's a delight it's a delight because it touches so many people and continues to yeah definitely if you sort of had to pick which was your favorite book in the series to narrate which one would that be Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Obviously, they got longer and longer, for which Joe constantly apologised. <laughs> like, you know, by the last one, it was an enormous book. But I think, I just mentioned it actually, possibly The Goblet of Fire. I think it's so well structured and I think she manages to bring in so many new elements of the Harry Potter world or universe, as everyone likes to call it, um, uh, you know, from from the, the foreign children who come in from different the different schools in Bulgaria and elsewhere. And um, and for the deepening of the, you know, adventure and uh, learning about the Ministry of Magic and these various other things. So it's less it's less entirely around just Harry and uh, and, and Hermione and, um, and, and Ron and, you know, and obviously um, all the wonderful figures at Hogwarts. But there's this sudden 
extra feeling that there's a lot more at stake, that the whole world is at, is at stake in a sense, which of course turns out to be true. So I, I think that one, and, and it just has so many good scenes in it, you know, that are really enjoyable to, to, to read, the diving under the water and all of that, the gillyweed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, the Goblet of Fire is definitely one of my favourites. And obviously, because you did all the character voices as well, was that like a planned thing? Did you know what the characters were going to sound like or was it a spur-of-the-moment thing? This is this is the trouble, if you know. It's not entirely spur-of-the-moment, but it, it would take so much more planning than I was able to do to be completely organised and certain about every voice. Because what happens, you know, as I said, I read the first book and I didn't know there were going to be six others. Nobody really knew except Joe. She had it firmly in her head that it would be that number of books. But we just kind of thought, well, we've read one and now we've read a second. And then when reading the second, uh, the, the the Chamber of Secrets, the engineer, is, as they're called, that's the person in the the other side of the glass from you who's, uh, you know, sliding all the slider knobs and uh, checking the balance and, and making sure that there's, you know, no technical hitch and, uh, and helping the editor uh, um, get it all right. As I came to say, I don't know, Parvit or some other character, minorish character, I would say to, to the engineer, have, have I read this character? Were they in the first book? And he would try and find it. So by the third book, he'd done this brilliant thing of taking every character in the first two books and putting their voice in a tiny file with a name that he could easily get. So by the third book, which was The Prisoner of Azkaban, I think, wasn't it? Yes. I was able to say, so what does so-and-so, Mrs., you know, Professor Grout sound like or whatever. And uh, and he would say, coming up, and within a second or two, I would hear how I read that character in the previous episode. And that's what we kept, this library of different voices. But um, sometimes, you know, when in, in a big scene where there are a lot of death eaters and there's a lot of violence coming, um, you have to make an in interesting choice because there's a lot of shouting in the scene. And I can shout with a deep voice like this, and I can shout with quite a high voice like that. But if it's a gruff voice, you know, as well, gruff voices, then it, it, it really does tear at the larynx. And you can, you can get an itchy cough as a result of it, or you can actually start to get very hoarse. So it's really important that if there's a character that talks like that, then there better be a very small character who doesn't have much to do, because it's a, the, the awful mistake is to realise, oh, my goodness, this character's coming back and back and back. You know, I mean, Hagrid was quite down there and rough. So I, you know, had to learn to make him a bit a bit more gentle just so that he didn't take too much out of me. And there's yeah. a story I tell as well about pronunciability because one of the things that was interesting is a lot of people came up to me over the first few years and they would say, do you know, I always thought that her name was Hermione Granger. And people who hadn't heard the name Hermione were just reading the book and thinking it was Hermione. I don't know if that would happen in Braille, but <laughs> I don't know if you read in Braille, but but maybe yeah. it, would, it wouldn't. But but um, so there was that kind of thing. But in the second book, I think it is, there was a phrase, and this is how the human voice can be very strange. And, and, and I particularly fall down with lots of short... Um, gentle, I think, is is the correct word. Gentles, which are T's and D's. In other words, you use your teeth to say them, to da. So words like visited it. You see, I always put in an extra syllable, visited it. And, and there was a phrase in this, in, in the Chamber of Secrets, um, and I think it was in reference to his wand, but it may have been something else, which was simply the three words, which I can say if I separate them very easily, Harry pocketed it. It's so, so easy. But as soon as I tried to say Harry pocketed it, it oh God, Harry pocketed it, Harry pocketed it, it Harry pocketed it, it ah! and, and the engineer was starting to laugh and the producer was laughing. Joe wasn't in that day that we were recording. Um, and she had made it clear that one of the conditions of having this audiobook version was that it had to be very accurate. It had to be exactly a representation of the book as she read it. 
So no should instead of would or which instead of that or, you know, no, no dropping of words. Because she felt that some children would be following it with their fingers uh, as a text and listening at the same time. And she didn't want them to be let down by, by any variation between the two. So I knew that. So the problem with Harry Potter, it, 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 I just couldn't say it. So we parked it and said, look, uh, we've got lunch in half an hour. I'll call Joe. So I called up Joe Rowling and said, Joe, um, that phrase, Harry Potter, did, 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 I just can't say it. Would it be okay if I said, Harry put it in his pocket? And she said, no. <laughs> the cruel woman. She she made sport of me because in every one of the following books, the phrase, Harry Pocket did it, occurs just as a little bomb for me so that was that was my that was my real sense of Grr. harry pocket did it, did it you see i don't know most people would not have problems with it but they might have problems with other things so everyone has their own little thing that they trip up over anyway that's that story evening <laughs> oh thank you for telling me that but yeah everyone's different everyone sort of struggles with different little things well you know obviously I'm still at school and I'm always curious to know how, you know, what other people's childhoods were like. So can you please tell me a bit about what your childhood was like? It was a childhood that might now seem to be almost 19th century, let alone early 20th century or mid 20th century, which is sort of what it was. Um, partly because I was, I suppose, fortunate enough to grow up in the country, in rural Norfolk, in a, a large house. I mean, it must be confessed, it was a, a big house. Uh, and we had what used to be called servants, but that sounds so old-fashioned and obscene almost that we have to say people who helped us out with. So there was a cook and and someone and gardeners. We had uh, gardeners and um, and being in, in the remote Norfolk countryside in the in a large country house that had a big stable block um, and and a, and a cottage that was all part of the. And uh, my father was an inventor. So um, he he converted the stable block. Uh, we didn't have horses, so he converted it into a laboratory for his work. And there were other outhouses as well. And the, we weren't on the main water supply. So my brother and I took it be in turns between us to, to pump the water up to, from two different tanks. There was a, a rainwater tank of soft water, which we used for the bath and for washing. They made wonderful soap suds because very soft water, um, you know, is is uh, beautiful for that. Although its colour is rather alarming, rusty. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, then there was the hard water, which came from a deep well, uh, and that was for drinking, and that was good for drinking, but not good for bathing anyway. And and we would have a fish man came round once a week with fish, um, and he came round in a horse and cart. Um, we had a bread van delivery grocery delivery and taking away from all from different shops the butcher came on another day um it was a very old-fashioned kind of country house living not downton abbey exactly but but still i suppose quite a long way away from most people's experiences of as an upbringing in the in the country but also i suppose unfamiliar to most people was the fact that at the age of seven i was uh, sent away to boarding school this was 200 miles from home because, as I say, I grew up in Norfolk and this prep school was in uh, in Gloucestershire, 200 miles away. Um, so my mother would come with me on the train from Norwich to London and we would spend a day at a you know, waxworks or a museum or something and she'd give, you know, give me a real treat of a good lunch. Um, and then she would take me to Paddington where... The school train would go, and it was a bit like Hogwarts. The, you know, that's to say, there was it wasn't the a whole train; it was half a train was devoted to the the school. And you, I would see when I, on my first time with my mother clutching her hand as a very nervous seven year old, I saw all these boys wearing these straw hats that are called boaters. That was kind of the sort of thing boys at private schools did wear then. I don't know why. Um, and it was really quite scary. And, and I could see my mother sobbing a bit and she sobbed more than I did. And so I was trying to cheer her up in the way that young children often do try and help cheer up their parents. It's sort of rather touching that you'd think I should be the one in tears and nervous and not wanting to go. But she was very sorry to lose me. But she had been away at a boarding school when she was four because it was the war and she was being hidden away because she was Jewish and 
you know, my uh, grandfather was quite sort of worried that uh, if the Germans invaded, she'd be in danger. Um, and my my father had been away at school when he was very young. He was a he'd been a chorister, a, a choir boy at uh, St Paul's Cathedral, and during the war they had evacuated to to Cornwall. So he'd gone away for as a young age as well. And I had an older brother, and he had gone to the same school and was still there when I was there. So although it sounds a bit cruel to send a child away at the age of seven, hundreds of miles from home. You have to remember that all the other children who are at the same school are in the same condition, the same situation. And it had happened to my parents and it happened to other boys I knew. And it seemed to be the normal way that children went to school because I was ignorant about the majority. I was ignorant about how most people went to day schools and didn't go to boarding schools. And they went to a local school and they got on a bus, went to the school, came back home again in the evening. And I didn't really know any children who did that. I only knew ones who were, I mean, isn't that terrible? But that's how things were divided by class in those days. So my childhood was, as I say, an unusual one of private schools. But by the time I got to the big school, the public school, as they're called, uh, when I was 13, I was already becoming a very difficult and um, badly behaved young young boy and so i was thrown out of that school then thrown out of another and then thrown out of another and oh my goodness me i went through all kinds of uh, disasters as a as a child um and but looking back on it i can't say i was badly used or abused or badly treated exactly by the teachers who were very good people trying to do a good job mostly some of them rather eccentric Nearly all of them had fought in one or other of the world wars of the 20th century. So they'd had their own experiences, as it were, of life that were fundamentally different from from the children's, you know, fighting in the trenches in the first war or fighting in the desert or wherever in the second war. And then suddenly they're in the English countryside teaching Latin to a load of school kids. It must have been very odd for them. But, yeah, it, it was... As I say, it's now a vanished world, I think, the world I grew up in. It's there in uh, period dramas and it's there in pictures and it's there in novels and stories, but um, very few people experience it now. They are much closer to their parents throughout their childhood. They don't go off for long, long periods. And they're not beaten as I was. I was regularly beaten with a cane, just very hard strokes on the bottom with a a very whippy cane and that was you know at least four times a week with me because i was so badly behaved um it would now be completely illegal and anybody who hits a child like that would be would be imprisoned <laughs> so, so it just shows how the world has changed so you are you asked about my childhood and i have to confess it was a pretty weird one um by today's standards it's amazing i've got away with with without going completely potty or perhaps <laughs> i have <laughs> Well, you have played many characters over the years. Is there one role that you particularly treasure? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, in fictional roles, I do enjoy the the, the comedy that I sort of started out with in the in the eighties and early nineties. Um, there was a series called Black Adder, which I I enjoyed very much, especially the fourth um, series of it, which was set in the trenches of the First World War, and I played a very a very disturbing. A uh, general called General Melchett, who meh, made loud noises like that a great deal, um, and thought nothing of sending his men into into danger without a care in the world. Um, and that was enormous fun. It really was extraordinarily good fun working with my very dear friend Hugh Laurie and with Ron Atkinson and Tony Robinson and uh, Tim McEnany and the, uh, the the other regulars in the back out of world. Um, but then also Hugh and I did a drama which was less um, kind of raucous than Blackadder, but also set in the past um, and based on some books that I've loved since I was a child, books by P.G. Woodhouse about a, a sort of rather asinine, a rather foolish young man in the, in the 1920s and early 30s called Bertie Wooster, who, um, who was, had a lot of money um and lived a, a life of kind of perfect foolishness um uh but was saved from disaster all the time by his extraordinarily wise and dependable manservant his valet his gentleman's personal gentleman whose name was jeeves and i played jeeves 
uh, and Hugh Laurie played Bertie Worcester, and we did a few series of those. And that was, again, immense fun. It was set in this beautiful time, the 1920s, where the motor cars we drove were these exquisite vehicles. And, and even, you know, the cocktail shakers and the sofas and the, every sort of aspect of the design and the costume was so glorious. And it was a, a fabulously... Uh, um, and, and the stories and the characters were so light and charming and brilliant and Woodhousean. Um, but 10 years after that, roughly, maybe a, um, not quite as much as that, I played a real person who was one of my great heroes in life, who's the Irish wit, playwright, um, philosopher, political commentator, I don't know what to call him, so many different words to describe him, Oscar Wilde. And he had a tragic life, but a, an extraordinary one. And so we made this film called Wild, and I played Oscar Wilde, and Jude Law played his lover, uh, um, Lord Alfred Douglas, known as Bosey. Um, and, it, you know, we had some young actors in it uh, and some older actors who who it was such a privilege to work with. And, and you know, I'm quite realistic about myself. I'm never going to be asked to play the roles in a film that Timothy Chalamet has just turned down or something. <laughs> I get to play characters, usually rather absurd, preposterous, British, over-the-top or um, villainous or, in some way, fruity characters. But just on this one occasion, I could play a lead character, a real person with depth and, um, and an all-round character and that was a tremendous honor so uh those three really i would say melchick jeeves and wild probably my favorites oh they all sound amazing and i can imagine how brilliant it would have been you know to play your idol really but yeah. are there any characters that you would love to play in the future well you know, I I don't make enormous claims for myself as one of the. You know, I'm not a great classical actor for whom the career is is you know lined with landmarks. Like then I did my Hamlet, and then came my Macbeth, and next my you know finally my King Lear. In, in the way that you know the great classical actors uh, mark out their lives with great Shakespearean roles. I've enjoyed playing Shakespeare. I played Malvolio, which is a terrific experience in Twelfth Night. Um, but I don't have a particular hankering to be full star for um, King Lear, which I suppose there's only two parts left for me, really. Possibly Angelo in, in Measure for Measure, if you know that play, but it's not his best-known play, but it's a very wonderful one. So I don't really think any great classical roles are, are, are things that I can particularly imagine myself playing. I like to be surprised. I like it when my agent calls up and says, oh, I'm sending through a script. They want you to play the part of Eddie, say, and you haven't read the script. You don't know what it's about. You don't know who Eddie might be. He could be somebody's uncle. He could be a lawyer. He could be anything. You just don't know. You start to read the script and suddenly Eddie pops up and you think, oh, my goodness, they want me to play this character, do they? And you read it and, um, you know, then maybe you, you play Eddie or maybe time for the film's actual production flashes with something else you're doing and so you have to say no and then you have the strange experience of watching somebody else a year or so later when the film comes out. And you, you kind of want to say to them, I was asked to play Eddie, <laughs> but you don't because it's you, you don't want to let an actor know they weren't first choice. Yeah. Do you prefer to play more heroic characters or more villainous characters, or do you not really have a preference? Hmm. <clears throat> Well, I don't have an absolute marked preference, though it has to be said that villainous characters tend to have more juice to them, if you like. They, they, they can smile and be charming while doing terrible things. And part of the pleasure of drama is the, um, the disconnect, if you like, between what someone does and how they behave and how they speak. They speak charmingly, they behave apparently very nicely, but underneath it they're, they're evil or wicked or trying to do terrible things. And it's fun to be charming but wicked. Whereas a hero is less likely to be opposite to himself. Yeah, he may have a temper tantrum, but then that's not very interesting if he's a hero. You just think, oh, get on with it and, you know, find your golden fleece, slay the monster, get the girl, whatever the story is, you know. Um and so so heroes are usually a bit duller just as people, if you know what I mean. 
Yeah, so. I yeah. <laughs> totally get what you mean. I feel like it would be a kind of kind of more fun to play a a, a more villain like character. I guess you can play around with it a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You've got it. Well, as as well as narrating many audiobooks, you've also written books of your own. So where do you find the inspiration for them? Uh, well, different writers have said different things about that, but they're all more or less inclining towards the same point, which is you sit down and you sweat and you swear and you shout until something comes out. Inspiration is a, a tricky one. You know, uh, I think Thomas Edison, the inventor, said invention is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, uh, which is a, a, a kind of amounting to the same thing. And of course, writing a story is invention. It is just a lot of very hard work, which is not something I moan about, because bizarrely, for those of us who are lucky, the, the intense pressure and laboriousness of writing is a pleasure, is because you know, it's not a pleasure when it's going very badly or in particular when you've dried up for you, you, you can't tell which way to go. You know, sometimes a plot gets stuck and you think, oh, how do I solve this? And and you pace up and down and you take any excuse to go to the shops to buy some eggs. You probably buy an egg one at a time just so you can go to the shop six <laughs> times to get half a dozen, anything to keep you out of that seat staring at that flashing cursor on the screen and and feeling that keyboard beneath you and resistant to every effort you 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 make and um and i've found the only way i know to to get out of that hole and every writer i i've ever spoken to has been in such a hole that of just getting stuck and not knowing which way to go writer's block they call it various different types of name for it um for that um and i found that paradoxically perhaps the way out of it is to write your way out of it, which sounds like, well, if you can write your way out of it, you wouldn't have the problem in the first place. But what I mean is write a different kind of writing. Instead of staring at your story where you've got Thomas and Mary and they've you know, both got to go out of the room in order to have this shock happen, like whatever it is the plot is, and you can't get them out of the room because she has to stay there, or she doesn't know this and he doesn't know that. What You know, the really dull mechanics of a plot, um, and you're not getting anywhere with them. Well, don't try and write that. Go to something else. Go to a diary, a journal, and say, literally start typing, Dear Diary, I am so annoyed today because I cannot solve a problem in my book. I'm writing this book, you see, and they've got this chapter, and I've got these characters, and they're called Tom and Mary, and I can't get Tom to do this because, oh, and I don't know whether to bring in a new character. I suppose I could do this, and oh, that, that wouldn't work because of that. And I suppose I could do this. Oh, yes, I could do. Ah, you actually, what you're doing is you're talking to yourself as you write, and that is something you can't do staring at a blank screen or just trying to frown your way out of an abstract problem like a plot. Instead, talk to yourself, literally talk to yourself. And the best way to do that is by using the same medium that you use in writing, which is the written word rather than the, rather than the spoken one. So you literally type out your problem. And it's a bit like what they call priming the well. Also, if you want to pump water up from a well, which, as I told you, my brother and I used to do in our house in Norfolk, um, you have to pour a little water down into the well first, and then that helps the pump action bring up new water. So that's my advice for what it's worth if you get stuck in writing, is to become unstuck by, by writing a diary message to yourself about how stuck you are, and just allow yourself to ramble and ramble and write and write and write, and, write, and you might write yourself out of the problem right okay that is so cool i'm currently listening to the audiobook version of your book mythos and i was wondering oh. how did you become interested in greek mythology all the way back to my first school that when i told you about the boarding school when i was seven where I, I found myself pretty useless at things that boys are most praised for being good at things like um you know, athletics and and games I couldn't catch a ball you know and I couldn't run in a straight line without banging into a tree I was sort of clumsy and uncoordinated virtually to the point of what I think would now be called dyspraxia um so that was out I couldn't dance I wasn't very good at music couldn't sing couldn't play a musical instrument very well uh, I couldn't draw or paint with any accuracy uh, but 
I had this knack for language. I had this ability to 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 use words in a fun and a fresh and sort of you know amusing way, at least for the amusement of my schoolmates. Um, I mean, and it being a boarding school, um, we were all in dormitories where we slept, and when the last person of authority, a prefect or a master in charge had left the dormitory and turned the lights out, I would tell stories, in, you know, to the dormitory. I'd make up stories and tell them. And I was also good at languages. And so that meant that I was doing Latin and Greek from an early age because I really enjoyed them. I thought they were like a fun game, like a code, you know. And and the Greek in particular involved passages for translation and reading about which included many of the stories of the greek myths and i became absolutely fixated by them i thought they were the best stories i'd ever come across they were so full of life and spirit and sometimes violence yes but a you know a kind of there was always a a point to them there was uh, something that was wanted a quest or a an achievement uh, and they, they just blew me away and so i i followed them and read as much about them as I could for years. And and then it was back here when I was in, in LA, I was doing a comedy show for a, a network TV here. And um, I wasn't in every episode, so occasionally I'd um, have time off. And, and I'd, I'd been at a party with some people and I can't remember how the subject came up, but I was kind of saying, oh, yeah, that reminds me of the story of, you know, how Zeus was born or whatever, um, you know, the, Zeus, the king of the gods. And I and I told it and everyone stared at me and went, well, I, you know, I, I'd heard of Zeus and I remember he like had a beard and, you know, maybe he had thunderbolts, but that's all I knew. How, how did you know about? And I said, oh, well, you know, I was used to love it when I was small and, I said, well, it's amazing, those stories. What else? You know, how else? And, and I would tell a few other stories. And then, so as I say, I was having one of those days off from, from filming, and, and I just started typing the beginning of the creation of the world, uh, according to Greek myth, how the world came out of chaos. And, um, and, and I carried on and carried on. And then it became kind of rather an obsession to do this, to tell the whole story of Greek myth again. And then I worried that maybe someone would, had done it recently and there was a lot in the market but i found actually no one had um and there was a, a real space uh, for retelling these stories in a way that young and old could be excited by them i hoped so so i did it and i did it on spec as the phrase goes in other words i wasn't being commissioned by my publishers i was just hoping that when i'd finished it i would call them up and say by the way i've got a book i hope you'll publish it it's <laughs> on the greek myths which is sort of what happened in my editor there at uh, Penguin, uh, at Michael Joseph, which is one of the um, Penguin uh, publishing houses. Uh, they said, you've done what? I said, well, yeah, I've actually finished it. So, and they went, well, send it. So I sent it. And they said, wow, we'll we'll publish it. <laughs> they were very pleased about it. And I was pleased. And that first book did extraordinarily well. It's all, you know, over a million. And, and, and um, uh, I who had already wanted and in depth was writing a second one, which was um, called Heroes, which is about the, the, the heroic characters that came slightly later in the Greek myth story. First of all, there was the great period of the gods and the gods making human beings and then mixing with human beings and punishing them and teasing them and ravishing them and all the things that gods did. And then in the sort of second phase, there were some of these characters who were who might have had a father or a mother who was a god or goddess, but then a human other parent, and they became the great heroes that got rid of the terrible beasts of the world. So characters like Hercules or Heracles and Theseus and, um, you know, uh, Perseus with his winged sandals, and Bellerophon and Atalanta, and Jason with his golden fleece, and also those were the heroes. And and then in the third book, uh, uh, the Trojan War, which is a whole other uh, part of Greek myth, this extraordinary siege of the city of Troy for 10 years, which includes characters like Odysseus and Achilles and Hector. Um, and I'm currently writing the fourth one, which is the journey home for all these heroes from the Trojan War. The journey home of Odysseus is particularly well known. It has a special word, his journey home which is used to describe other people's epic journeys, and that is an odyssey, the odyssey of Odysseus. And uh, so there's that and, and and the going home of other people. So it's, yeah, it's become quite a sort of thing over the last 10 years. It's dominated quite a lot of my life. Yes, it definitely seems like it. And it's such an interesting book and I would definitely recommend it. Now, you have openly spoken about having bipolar disorder. 
What would you say are some of the common misconceptions associated with it? Well, firstly, I think people understand that there's an element of it which involves depression and that depression, as people know, it can be a severely debilitating condition in which all hope and joy um, and all sense of the future is sucked away from the person suffering from that condition. Um, and, and it can cause such a dislike of the present, such a pain at having to live in the present, such a pain at being oneself that often, especially young people, try to distract that pain by causing a more physical, clearer as it were, almost in their minds, perhaps a healthier pain. And, well, you know, we call that self-harm, you know, the cutting and the things that has become quite a problem amongst the young. Um, well, we know about that side of depression and unhappiness, and it, it, it involves a lack of energy, a lack of connecting with other people, or desiring to be with other people, a, 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 a requirement to be alone and in the dark, and as I say, with no energy and with no sense of tomorrow meaning anything but bipolar means two poles so like the earth has a north pole and a south pole if you imagine that that depression is the south pole people with bipolar disorder also have a north pole and that is the exact opposite which is what bipolar means really it's the exact opposite pole of depression so where depression is all about a lack of energy a lack of hope a lack of future a lack of color a lack of brightness the opposite which is sometimes called mania or hypermania, um, is an exalted state of energetic exuberance and grandiosity and and mad plans for the future and a, and a desire to be in touch with people all the time. And so phoning people up at three in the morning, saying, oh, I've just had this great idea and, and feeling kind of sort of touched with this magical energy and creative fire and, um, and it's maddening for people to live with someone in that condition because... They can be so kind of thoughtless in their exuberance and their fullness and their, you know, they can rearrange rooms and, you know, I spoke to someone whose uh, husband had been in a, a manic state and had stripped their car, had completely taken their car apart in order to put it back again together in a better condition polishing every single unit of it they'd laid it out on a sheet and they'd marked out each part with a with a you know a, a, a heavy marker you know and um so every and with a number everything was perfectly organized and they were so excited and then their condition changed the cycle turned and they became depressed and they just kicked aside the whole thing and all the numbers got lost and everything all the detail and this poor woman's car was basically just a wreck of pieces. And um, and so that's that's one of the things people forget is the bipolar nature of it. And also that it's very hard, and therefore I think probably wrong, for anyone to try and understand a cause for it. If someone is depressed, it's very tempting to say, well, why? What's gone wrong? But very often nothing has gone wrong except inside their own mind. Uh, and in that sense... It's like the weather, it's absolute and it's real. And there it is, it's gray and it's raining, but you can't say there's a reason for it that you can look after and say, well, if you, know, if you just you know, think about the good things in life, it'll stop raining. Well, that's obvious nonsense. And it's the same with bipolar. It's a condition that has hit you. It, it may be triggered by things, but the point really is that it is, it is an illness like, a, uh, like any other chronic illness, like, say, asthma, where you get a wheeze. And it may be the wheeze is caused by something that you're allergic to. It may be just from the mind. It may be... But the most useful thing is how, how do you cope with that wheeze? And people who, are, who have suffered from asthma have inhalers and they have ways of, of coping. And similarly, people with bipolar disorder, they, they may not, because it may be so serious, they're finding it very hard to cope. But um, there, there are ways that you can help yourself. And the most important are to let people know of your condition, to let people you know and love and trust, your family and your very best friends, to know that you have an illness, just like a diabetic has an illness, or as I say, a, a, an asthmatic has an illness, or anybody uh, who, who has an illness. It just happens not to be an illness that is represented by spots on the skin, like measles, or it's not represented by a coughing, like whooping cough, but it's represented by mood swings and so long as people understand that and they're there for you when when the mood does swing then at least you don't have to add 
to the catalogue of woes that mental illness can bring upon you, at least you don't have to add the frustration of your friends not understanding and, and then almost making it worse by sort of telling you to you know, walk it off or just have a nice drink or something, which, you know, isn't really very helpful, even if they mean well. So, yes, I think there's a lot a, a lot people can do to understand the condition um, and forgive people with mental health disorders for sometimes the disruption or embarrassment that their behaviour can cause. Uh, so that's an important one too. I think. Yes, definitely. I think because mental health is such a large, large spectrum, isn't it? And yeah. I think... Uh, I, I know that you are president of the mental health charity Mind, um, and I think that there are there are a lot of stigmas um, around mental health. And I think one of the big ones is that say say you were talking to someone with anxiety, and I say this because I suffer with it. You know, mm. just things like the phrase oh, "Don't worry about it" or "Cheer up, you'll be fine." Yeah. It it doesn't work, and it's no. all about validating someone's feelings and going, "I'm sorry that you." Are going through that you yeah. know is there anything that i can do to help it's all about checking up on people and validating Absolutely feelings right because saying cheer up is suggesting that the answer is in the hands of the person suffering from the anxiety yeah. all they have to do is be a little bit more positive and everything will be okay but you wouldn't say that to someone with a migraine headache or uh, an asthma attack or or a, a diabetic episode of hyper I've seen there or something, you would say, how can I help? Is there something you take? Is it easier if you sit down? Is there someone I can be in touch with? Would you rather be alone? Or is it nice if I sit and chat with you? Just let me know and I'll, I'll do what I can. And and that's what a good friend would say. And and, and that's such a relief because it otherwise part of the problem of having an episode of some kind with mental health ramifications is that added to everything else is your worry and concern about other people misrepresenting you or getting in the way or not wanting to insult them by saying, please just leave me alone. You know? <laughs> it's it, and So, yeah, and I think that is something that has changed enormously. And we at Mind are very thrilled at how much more your generation in particular, Evie, understands this and is capable of being helpful and kind to friends who are going through something. Yeah, definitely. I think it's all just about having that support network, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, well, what has been your proudest moment in your life so far? Oh, my goodness me. That's a very tricky one, I would say. I mean, you know, it comes in fact because my childhood was so... I mean, I'm not going to go into detail because it would take too long and it's complicated. Though I could say that I wrote a book in which I told the story and people could always get hold of that. Um, <laughs> but because my school days were so bad and I was expelled, as I'd said earlier, from a number of schools, it actually went on even further than that. And, and I went at the age of 17, then 18, um, to prison. Um, I, I was uh, arrested for credit card theft and fraud and uh, was at my absolute lowest conceivable ebb. I'd been expelled from these schools. It seemed there was no way back into the normal world for me. I had cut off all, all, all I mean, I hadn't, my parents hadn't cut me off, God bless them. They, they'd sort of run out of ideas as to how I could ever go back to a school or a college again, because I'd been thrown out of so many. But they, you know, they still believed in me in some way. And, and, um, when I left prison on 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 the, and I was on two years probation, I decided that it wasn't too late that if I really made an effort, I could get into the university of my dreams, which was Cambridge University. Um, and I in, the, in those days you had to take a separate series of exams, to, uh, uh, Cambridge entrance exams, <clears throat> and the local college in Norwich didn't teach those, so I got jobs um, and took out past examination papers from the city library to see what sort of questions were asked in those papers and paid a lecturer at the local college to, to be my invigilator for the exam. So I paid to do the exam and paid him to, to be the official person who was standing there in the examination hall with only me as the, the pupil being examined, the only student being examined. And he would, um, you know, tell me when time was up and take my paper and put it in an envelope and send it off to the examiners. Well, anyway, I, I, that, the, the prize I hoped if I'd done well enough 
might be that I would be allowed in to Cambridge University. And and that would make up for all the A-levels I never did and all the things I never, you know, all the hopelessness. And, and it, I was at, at home in that house in Norfolk I was telling you about, which was remote-ish from Norwich, let's say. I mean, not by Australian or American standards remote, but it, the only way to get in really was a morning coach at about about six in the morning. There was a coach that went by a nearby lane and you'd stand at the corner and wave and then you could get in. And I said to my mother, after five days of waiting in the post to see if Cambridge had let me know whether or not I was going to go to the university, I said, I can't take it anymore. I'm going into Norwich. I'm going to see some friends. I'll be in this cafe at lunchtime, mother. And if by any chance the post has come, because the post used to come very mid-morning, um, you know, I said, if anything has come, you've got my permission to open it, and then you can phone me at the cafe and, and let me know. So anyway, I had the day in Norwich, saw some friends, went to the cafe at lunch. I'm having, I'd forgotten all about it, really, and I was having a nice time chatting, telling stories, friends. Suddenly the owner of the cafe said, Stephen, your mother's on the phone. I thought, oh, my God, I'll know whether I've got into Cambridge or not. And my mother's there on the other end. I said, well, did, did a letter come? And she said, no. I said, oh, God, you got me all excited. I thought there was going to be a letter. She said, no, there isn't a letter. There's been a telegram. No, a telegram, even back then in 1978, or was it 77? Actually, 77, um, was a very rare old-fashioned form of communication. No one got telegrams. It was, you know, Second World War type of thing. I said, a telegram? She said, yes, I'll read it. And it said, congratulations, awarded scholarship, Queen's College, Cambridge, senior tutor. And it's not only I had not only got in, but I got a scholarship. And I was the only one with the scholarship of that year in my college in, uh, in that subject. It was the top scholarship. And, and, and I was so, I could not believe that after, after being the most disastrous son to my parents, the most disastrous scholar or pupil that could be imagined, failing everything, not even finishing everything and being expelled for, for terrible behavior and, and all the rest of it, that I had managed through my own willpower and determination to sit those exams and not only get through, but actually get a scholarship. And 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 I don't think anything will match that because from that, everything else followed that gave my life the good fortune. I, it's there that I met my friends, Emma Thompson and Hugh Laurie with whom I then made a comedy series and then with Hugh, many more other things. And it's where I learned so much about myself and about words and art and thought and all the and work itself uh, all, all the valuable lessons i suppose that you could learn and it was all just in the nick of time that's what made it so oh. very fortunate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that is genuinely phenomenal. And you should be so proud of yourself. And that just shows, I guess, doesn't it, that no matter what goes wrong, if you work hard enough, and if you believe in yourself, you can always turn it around. Yeah, I guess that is the message. And and it, and it it's often said as if that's an easy, easy thing. But actually, one of the hardest things in the world is to believe in yourself. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you, I, I always say it's a bit like if you remember when when you were a child, most of us, some kids didn't find this a problem, standing on the high diving board. And mm. I would stand there and my, my knees were not together. And I would say, I can do this. I know I can do it. And even if it's a belly flop, it's not really going to hurt me. All I have to do is just let go. Just believe in yourself, do it. And then I would try it and go. And I'd almost think I'd done it. And then I'd turn back and, and to whistles and jeers and cat calls, I would climb down from the diving board and say, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. Um, and, and all I wanted to do was believe in myself. But I couldn't in that in that space that strange physical one of doing a dive and 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 in and in others people can say you know uh, I I just didn't think I could do it like say some people feel like that about public speaking could you you know could you be my the best man at my wedding and say no I couldn't I just couldn't make a speech in front of other people I can't do it and you want to say them believe in yourself and you can do it but. You realise just saying believe in yourself is an easy thing to do, but actually believing in yourself takes real guts, I suppose, or, yeah. you know, um, but there's luck as well. You know, I was lucky to have parents who didn't give up on me, lucky to have the ability to, you know, sit that exam, get jobs in bars and places like that, um, and, and as a waiter, enough to be able 
to to see myself through. And enough, lucky enough that it was in the in the seventies and early eighties when you could go to university and you got all your expenses paid for by your local authority. Um, uh, you got a grant um, and money for books, and um, it, there was no loan. It, it was all just given to you by the state. <laughs> right, okay. Different world, different world from today, so yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you're right. Believing on, in yourself is one of the most tricky things in the world, and I really do struggle with it. But, you know, that is phenomenal that you were able to do that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been such an honour, such a pleasure to meet you. Um, I think you're just such an amazing person. So thank you so much. Really, from from such an, an amazing person as you, that is a wonderful compliment. I wish you could see how wide my smile is, but I can see <laughs> how wide yours is. So that makes up for it. It's been an absolute delight speaking to you. Thank you. You make conversations so easy. You could teach a lot of people in this podcast world how to do it. Thank you, Evie. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you to my audience for listening. And I will see you all next time.